Hello, and welcome to our worldwide virtual audience. Uh, the last two weeks have witnessed some clashes between China and India, the two most populous nations in the world, uh, both nuclear armed uh, and both with a disputed border of more than 2000 miles. Uh, what does uh, this mean for the world? What does it mean for India and China? Uh, the most important context, of course, is that it uh, shows Chinese aggressive behavior and it also points uh, against uh, the conventional wisdom of some that China's rise is going to be peaceful. Uh, we at Hudson Institute have always questioned that notion and today only the India-China clash but also what it means both in understanding Chinese behavior and how to deal with it. Uh, with me for this discussion today are Patrick Cronin uh, who is the Asia Pacific Security Chair here at Hudson Institute. Uh, his work challenges and the opportunity uh, uh, analyzes the challenges and opportunities confronting the United States in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we also have Dr. John Lee, who is a senior fellow at Hudson Institute. He has in the past served as a senior national security advisor uh, to the Australian Foreign Minister John Bishop and has served as the principal advisor on Asia and for economic, strategic and political affairs uh, to, uh, in the, uh, uh, to the Australian government uh, about the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, lastly, we have Dr. Aparna Pandey. She is the director of uh, Hudson Institute's initiative on the future of India and is the author of a forthcoming book, Making India Great, The Promise of a Reluctant Great Power. So let's begin with you, Aparna. Why don't you tell us what has been happening and what does it mean for India above all? Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on a panel with Hudson colleagues and friends. Uh, the India-China border dispute is a legacy of the colonial era, with modern India accepting the boundary line that it inherited from the British Empire. China, however, has never accepted the borders it inherited, and since the 1950s has consistently sought to change the ground reality along the 2,167-mile-long border that India refers to as the line of actual control. The last time the two countries fought a war was in 1962, but ever since there have been skirmishes at periodic intervals through the 1960s, 70s and 80s. The current standoff, however, represents an escalation not seen since 1962. 20 Indian soldiers were killed, 76 more were injured, and 10 were initially captured and then later released by the Chinese. PLA troops were also injured and killed, though as of now, there is no official number released by Beijing. The latest standoff dates back to April of this year, and it took place in Ladakh in the former Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir at three different places, Galwan Valley, Pangong So, and Hot Springs. The PLA moved its troops forward seeking to take over territory it had not taken over uh, in earlier year, years. This led to border skirmishes. Um, in early June, after military and diplomatic level talks, the two sides engaged in what is we refer to as de-escalation. However, during this de-escalation process, a violent clash took place which resulted in deaths and injuries on both sides. Um, China has used the last few decades of peace with India. Um, so, uh, China is today one of the largest trading partners of India, but it has used this, this, these decades to actually build its capability and infrastructure on its side of the line of actual control. It has airstrips, helipads, and the ability to bring in thousands of troops at short notice. India, however, is far behind and is still playing catch up. In the last few years, as India has upped its ante and built infrastructure, the standoffs have been increasing and will most likely continue in the months and years to come. I will stop now. Thank you. Good. Well, John, uh, it, it's obvious that this hasn't come in isolation. Uh, there has been in uh, Chinese aggressive behavior for a while. Uh, there's been aggressive behavior in Southeast Asia, uh, what people call the salami slicing approach. Uh, to the South China Sea, you know, get little bits and pieces at one time, not big enough for the rest of the world to think of full-fledged war or full-fledged military action. Uh, 
but regaining territory. Uh, of course, they are not making new islands, at least in the Himalayas. Uh, they can't do that, but they are slowly two steps forward, one step backward. They are already one step ahead. Then there is the behavior in Hong Kong. Uh, there have been economic threats against Australia. Uh, and uh, uh, there have been belligerence generally uh, towards uh, Southeast Asia, Taiwan, Japan. Um, how do you see the situation evolving and what does it mean for the security of the Indo-Pacific? Uh, thank you, Ambassador, and great to be with my Hudson colleagues. Um, I've been watching China's behaviour for quite a long time, being where I am in uh, Sydney or Canberra, Australia. And if you look from East Asia to South Asia to the continental borders uh, that China has, Beijing has a general approach when it comes to dealing with territorial or political disputes. Uh, it will seek to change the territorial or the political or even the psychological status quo in its favour and then and only then seek to de-escalate uh, through dialogue and diplomacy, uh, but all the while holding on to the gains that it has achieved um, during that period. But this will include coercive measures to compel that other countries having a dispute with to keep that issue into, or to ensure that that issue remains a bilateral issue between China and that country. Uh, the one exception I think is that when it comes to countries more powerful than China, which is to say the United States, uh, this is where Beijing will often try to uh, not multilateralize, but expand the issue uh, into the global conversation. It will use its tools of propaganda and other messaging tools to win friends and condemn the United States. Now, if Beijing believes another country that is a weaker country is, is itself changing um, territorial, the political or the psychological status quo against Beijing's interests, uh, then Beijing will not rest until it has wrestled back that advantage. Uh, even if that other country is simply responding to what China has previously done, which is particularly to the Indian situation. And I think this is when Beijing is most enraged, uh, and this is when you see the most feral side of uh, Chinese diplomacy. Uh, it is currently doing that against my country, Australia, and one can argue it is doing that against uh, India at the moment because New Delhi is daring uh, to increase building infrastructure on its side of the line of control. Uh, with respect to India, it seems to me that Beijing has become used to getting its way. And this is so, I think, for several reasons. Uh, one, as Anna mentioned, China is well ahead on building infrastructure, roads, checkpoints, moving its troops to strategic positions uh, on each side of the line of actual control. Uh, and two, Beijing has generally been able to uh, control the pace of escalation and de-escalation, uh, escalating when it's gaining the advantage and de-escalating when it's presenting that advantage as a fait accompli to the Indians. Uh, so in this context, it seems to me that China has been or has become alarmed by India's more proactive tendencies in recent times. Uh, this includes New Delhi reaching out to Taiwan, uh, restricting Chinese foreign direct investment, uh, greater warming towards the Quad when before it was a bit of a laggard, uh, and of course formally stripping uh, Jammu and Kashmir of autonomy in 2019. Uh, which has implications regarding China and India potentially in uh, Luta. So sure enough, the rage and I would say the scornfulness against India, and you see that from Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi down to the Chinese ambassador, down to the state press such as the Global Times, that rage and scornfulness has been dialed up uh, several notches since last year. Uh, in fact, uh, I think there are strong similarities between uh, China's approach to India at the moment with China's approach to Australia. It is driven by deep anger as much as it is about some sort of tactical or strategic play. 
uh, by the Chinese. Now, very quickly, uh, and we can discuss the broader uh, region in, during the questions, but some broad Indian options. Let me just offer some general comments because I think there's still too many unknowns about the current situation uh, to speak authoritatively on it. Uh, Beijing has been defective because it negotiates with actions while other countries give up leverage and seek to negotiate with words. So my advice would be to offer whatever soothing words you want if you're the Indians, but try to extend your practical leverage and advantage as much as possible whilst that diplomatic conversation takes place. You don't see through activities whilst you have that diplomatic conversation. Uh, Beijing has shown that it offers no meaningful concessions, regardless of whether New Delhi is escalating or de-escalating, regardless of whether New Delhi is pursuing a proactive or passive policy. And this extends not just to the border dispute, but to other issues, for example, the Quad, relations with, with the United States and Taiwan, uh, investment restrictions, export controls, and so on. So it seems to me that New Delhi, if anything, should err on the side of being too proactive uh, rather than too passive, because to put it very simply, Beijing will continue to do whatever it wants, regardless of what New Delhi um, is, is, is actually doing diplomatically. But moreover, New Delhi seems needs, I think, to wrestle back control of the Chinese narrative that this is a historical dispute between India and China and it is no one else's business. Uh, at issue here, I think, is the totality and the pattern of Chinese behaviour and Chinese coercion with respect to all of Beijing's territorial and political disputes, not just the one with India. And Beijing is by far the most uh, or the more revisionist, by far the more aggressive, by far the more coercive, and by far the less trustworthy when it comes to dealing with countries with which it has disputes. Uh, in a COVID-19 world, which we're currently in, where Chinese actions are increasingly being called out in all parts of the world, uh, India will win more friends and sympathy than will Beijing if these actions are called out. Finally, it's heartening that India is invited to attend the G7 summit later this year by uh, President Trump. Uh, my suggestion is India should make a show of being a natural maritime and continental counterpoint uh, to the values and the policies of China in the region. The appetite uh, for that is strong. Uh, so there are favourable wins uh, if India and other countries so choose uh, in the next few months ahead. I'll stop there and uh, come back to the question. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, great. Uh, the most important thing that I heard from John Lee was about how India sometimes lets China, not sometimes, but most of the time, lets China get its way. Uh, some people would argue that a lot many countries let that happen. Uh, and so we will come back to that theme. And why is that? Uh, Patrick Cronin, you've written about China's total uh, competition uh, sort of campaign. and. Uh, the need for strengthening US alliances and partnerships. Uh, let us talk about uh, this particular situation in the context of that. Uh, are we really uh, sort of ready uh, for China's challenge? And do we have the alliances and partnerships in place or is it a lot of talk? I mean, India, for example, had what was known as the Wuhan spirit and then the, uh, was it Mamalipuram? Uh, sort of summit and came back saying, now we've talked China and we've got something under control. President Trump has repeatedly said, I've talked to President Xi and things are okay and they're going to be very good. They're going to be beautiful. Uh, they don't seem to be beautiful. So what direction are we headed? In? Well, Ambassador Hakani, uh, as you know so well, uh, international relations are a messy business, but we try to make them seem clear and coherent and rational. And I, I suspect we're all guilty here today of trying to uh, make uh, policies that are quite complicated and sometimes contradictory seem streamlined and rational. But in that vein, let me start by saying that I do see what China's doing along the Himalayan frontier with India as part of their total competition campaign. They're, the calculus 
that has uh, been made in Beijing and by Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party seems rather clear uh, because we now have um, eight plus years under Xi Jinping to uh, watch the pattern grow. Um, so I'd say these actions that were taken on the 15th of June uh, were premeditated. They were part of a, a pugnacious, even overextended foreign policy hand that Xi Jinping is increasingly playing uh, around the region and globally. <clears throat> it's hard not to see Beijing's external policy dr as driven by this kind of incremental uh, imperial expansion. Um, it wants to control the future economic technological connectivity and lines of communication um, well beyond the old Silk Road uh, and throughout the Indo-Pacific and beyond. Uh, it's asserting administrative, legalistic, and even physical control over its uh, periphery. <clears throat> it's opposed to defense improvements by others. They're always bad by Chinese definition. And they're in their uh, sort of uh, inflated sense of becoming a preeminent regional military power is increasingly showy, not just in the, the tabloid uh, newspaper like the Global Times that John Lee rightly uh, called out as, as being always on the front lines of their wolf warrior sort of media diplomacy. Um, but under Xi, the military is looking for its first combat experience since 1985. Um, if you go back to the 1962 war, uh, China brought in not only tactical military superiority over India, but also recent military experience uh, from, frankly, uh, fighting Americans and South Koreans in the Korean War. Um, and they were, they were bursting, but they've not had that kind of combat experience and not spilled blood in combat uh, until really June 15th, even if that combat in this case was a rather medieval me melee, not, not sort of modern conventional uh, capabilities. I, I see ominous parallels as well between China's dredging and reclamation of the South China Sea, something you mentioned, Ambassador Khani, with what China has done to nudge forward in the Himalayan frontier, creating um, uh, you know, the, the um, canals that were created in the Galwan River, for instance, over this past decade, can be likened to the dredging in the building of artificial island reefs in the Spratleys. Um, I think that the nine dash line claim in the South China Sea goes back to what Aparna was talking about, the fact that PRC has never accepted the line of actual control, the McMahon line. Um, they were not at that conference from their perspective and, and they've, they've been challenging it and trying to challenge it with facts on the ground. They did it in the 50s and 62, and they've been doing it incrementally uh, more recently as well. Um, you know, Nehru, when you go back to the 62 war, it was very interesting to see that it was Nehru and the Indians seeking the opportunity that they thought existed because China looked like it was down. Its alliance with the Soviet Union was fractured. Um, they were having internal trouble. Remember, Mao was uh, worried about even a, a, some kind of a coup inside. He had fired his his uh, hero defense chief, um, put him in exile in, uh, in, in, a, in a trader's home in, in Peking and in Beijing. Um, and um, now you have, um, and Mao had said, look, I want armed coexistence. I want to push back on the Indians. Um, you wave a gun and I'll wave a gun, Mao said. We'll stand face to face and each practice our courage. Well, we saw that at Docklam in 2017. We, we saw it over the last few months and now on June 15th. They're really wanting to uh, challenge uh, the neighbors. Um, not as John Lee said, uh, you know, United States directly, but they're challenging in all the, the seams of relations that exist along their borders. Let me just quickly say that the other two basic drivers here for China's calculus, it's not just been the sense of sovereignty, um, and this, the, but it's also been uh, the opportunity that I've just really been trying to uh, highlight. Uh, the global pandemic, the economic and social fallout from that, uh, U.S. election, uh, you know, uh, even probably John Bolton's book, who knows? But I mean, the point is that the, the Chinese sense uh, an, an opportunity, and they know it's a limited opportunity because they know that there is a lot of political pushback on China if the democracies in particular can get their act together. Um, so the Chinese are seizing this opportunity. If you go back to the 1962 war, when did that war begin? It began right after the Cuban Missile Crisis was setting in. Um, that's no accident, um, and this was no accident either. I would submit this was a deliberate uh, time challenge by the uh, by the Chinese of the Indians. Uh, and the third issue is Xi Jinping needs domestic uh, support. He is l losing um, probably um, or gaining really doubts about his leadership. 
about his governance. Ever since the economy started to slow down, that's been hastened further by the pandemic, the handling of the pandemic, the uh, relations souring with other countries around the world. All of those are probably calling into question uh, Xi Jinping's leadership at a time when his doubling down on uh, the Sinosphere and cracking down on the Uyghurs in Tibet and Hong Kong um, and threatening Taiwan, all of that, and even threatening Australia and, 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 and the Cold War with the United States so-called and the Chinese press, all of these actions I think are being second guessed by uh, thinking Chinese who really wonder whether Xi Jinping is the man to lead them to this China dream or whether the China dream and Xi thought maybe should should take a different direction here in the next few years. I'm gonna stop there because I do wanna come back in the Q&A and talk about uh, US policy and what else we can do to build on what I think is bipartisan support for this uh, long-term US-India and US-India-Australia-Japan quad and um, just supporting India's uh, peaceful rise. Well, everyone has spoken about uh, the need for uh, alignments and alliances. Uh, India uh, doesn't like the term alliance very much. It usually wants to be a partner, or a friend, or a whatever else, but not an ally, because they still have some hangover from their non-alignment. Uh, they think that a military alliance is somehow flawed. Uh, do the Chinese sense an opportunity there, Aparna? Uh, because, after all, India has deepened its partnership with Australia, with the United States, with Japan, with the Southeast Asian nations. But at the same time, there seems to be a reluctance even now, Prime Minister Modi's uh, sort of attempt to try and play down the significance of what China did and saying that, you know, the Chinese haven't taken our territory, etc., which basically means that they are trying to redefine the line of actual control instead of saying, hey, the Chinese have by force tried to change the line of action, uh, actual control. So do we sense a reluctance on the part of, uh, on the one hand, to India's credit, they are the one country that has consistently for the last two, three decades said that China's rise is not going to be peaceful and that China's intentions are not uh, as simple as some American administrations also seemed to indicate uh, that they thought that they were. Uh, so where does India stand and what is India planning, if anything? Um, thank you, Ambassador. I'll sort of, uh, yes, India is all sort of would prefer a hedging strategy. And that is what India has done in the last decade or two. Uh, while India has come closer to the United States, uh, India is part of Quad, India is part of Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, and India has been building infrastructure. India is still reluctant uh, to openly uh, sort of state or challenge China. The Prime Minister Modi's speech, I think two years ago in Shangri-La had basically said that Indo-Pacific is not anti or against any country. And even China can be part of Indo-Pacific strategy if it so desires. The second part to this concern also is that um, however close India becomes to any country, India does not believe that a country will send troops to the Himalayan border. And so even if India does have support in Indo-Pacific and in the maritime domain from Australia, the ASEAN countries, United States, Japan, on the land border with China, India is alone. Um, there are those who argue, however, that the way to push back against China is one, maritime. India is a continental and maritime power, but for decades, India's policy has always been to view itself as a continental power and not a maritime one. So India has not really built its, its maritime capabilities, which can actually push back against China. And there, its, its partnerships or alliances with other countries would be useful, um, sort of. But I mean, I think that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Uh, and and Baxter, if I could just quickly uh, add something there. I, you know, I, I was in the Australian government when the Quad was reinstituted in uh, 2017. Um, and when we dealt with our Indian counterparts in Australia, and of course, India, uh, the India-Australia relationship was probably the weakest link in the Quad. Um, and we're, every time we spoke to the Indian officials, they would always raise this issue of non-alignment. And the Australian approach, uh, which, which I was part of, was to 
change the language from non-alignment to strategic autonomy. And I think there's a big difference there because the argument we were trying to make to New Delhi was um, what you really want is strategic autonomy, strategic freedom. So the question is what gives you more autonomy and freedom of action? joining the Quad or not joining the Quad in light of China's actions. So that's the way we tried to, in Australia, we tried to sort of get round this non-alignment concept and move to strategic autonomy. Uh, there are uh, people here on this call who are much more uh, educated about Indian policy than I am, but I sense that strategic autonomy is probably where India is heading as opposed to strict non-alignment. Strategic autonomy is the term that is used more in India now, uh, but the fact still remains uh, that India's military modernization is uh, behind schedule. Um, India uh, also has not increased its defense budget significantly uh, for several years, um, and India's foreign policy still remains uh, one in which they uh, sort of come to Western nations and democracies and talk about the, the potential of China uh, sort of uh, uh, encircling India, but at the same time, they go to China and they say nicer things there. Uh, Aparna talked about a hedging strategy. John, don't you think that um, maybe a lot of countries, including Australia, have had a hedging strategy? There are people like you, there are others, there have been officials uh, who do not want to hedge, but by and large, China has had the advantage of, uh, because of its uh, deep economic ties because of its penetration of intellectual institutions, academic institutions, debate, discourse, two, three decades of not being seen as a challenger, it has actually been able to install itself in a situation where people are kind of divided. Do we really need to confront them? Do we really need to, you know, should we just kind of get along? Why can't we all get along? And, and that does produce a hedging strategy that is not conducive to a strategy of collective containment of the kind that was put in place uh, after the Second World War vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union? Uh, yes, yes, I, I think China has been very clever until recently in persuading countries that, hey, you're better off hedging, you're better off staying on the sidelines, seeing what the future holds for you, uh, rather than taking tough decisions. Uh, and that suits China because it is China who is the one changing the status quo. So if you want to change the status quo, it's in your interest to tell everyone else essentially to remain on the sidelines or, or not take any hard decisions. Uh, in the current or the present day, my personal assessment of my region is that um, outside of the United States, Japan, um, Australia, increasingly India and Vietnam, every other country is essentially hedging. No particularly maritime country likes what China is doing, but those, it's only those countries that I mentioned that have moved uh, decisively from hedging to balancing and countering. Uh, every other country is hedging, and I think that presents problems, uh, as, as you raise, for the Quad countries and countries like Vietnam, um, because it is very difficult to uh, move these countries out of that hedging mindset, given they've been um, they've had this mindset for so long. It's interesting that Vietnam itself has experienced Chinese aggression in the past. So one 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 makes uh, understands why they are along with uh, India uh, countries that are concerned about Chinese aggression, and the others uh, sort of possibly have hedging strategies also because they have not they don't have the kind of muscle that might be needed uh, to confront China if a stage of confrontation. Uh, 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 arrives. Uh, Patrick, uh, two things. You spoke about uh, Xi Jinping's domestic compulsions. Now, he has, of course, abandoned the whole notion of collective leadership and has emerged as uh, the leader and wants to be the leader for an indefinite period. Uh, that definitely uh, encourages uh, a more aggressive external uh, policy because uh, uh, when things are not going right, such leaders usually do uh, try to uh, generate nationalism uh, by taking on external enemies. Uh, uh, should we be even more concerned than the four of us already are uh, about uh, Xi Jinping's domestic compulsions leading to greater uh, 
assertiveness and aggression abroad? And secondly, what do you think the United States is doing and can be doing in relation to China's uh, assertiveness or aggression? Well, those are excellent questions. I think uh, we should be worried, um, but in measured uh, terms, uh, trying to uh, shore up deterrence all around uh, where there are flashpoints. Um, obviously, Hong Kong, I think, was collateral damage for some of what Beijing was feeling and wanting to do to exert its nationalism, with knowing that there was very little the international community could do directly in response to imposing this uh, national security law, which is still in draft, but probably be completed in the next couple of weeks, um, and will essentially end the one country, two systems. It'll be one system imposed on Hong Kong well before the 2047 uh, deadline of the uh, of the handover treaty of Hong Kong. Um, talking about strategic autonomy, Hong Kong thought it had some, but uh, time ran out early because Xi Jinping needed to exercise that power because his uh, his drive to to be in power uh, for a third and maybe longer term uh, is called into question. Um, you know, we've seen the decibels of the rhetoric of China rising over the last six months. We've seen their nibbling strategy get more aggressive, including in the South China Sea, including the military threats toward Taiwan. And now we've got actual bloodshed uh, by uh, Chinese troops um, on their border. The Chinese are very reluctant to talk about the casualties. Aparna said, we don't know the number of casualties. That's correct. Although the uh, Indian press has been reporting from government sources, presumably, that the Indian government handed over 16 bodies, 16 dead Chinese soldiers. Uh, so at a minimum, 16 Chinese soldiers were killed in that melee on the 15th of June that happened over five hours of, on that night um, in the Gawan Valley and, and nearby. Um, that is a, a watershed. Um, if we go back to the 1950s, if we go back to China, you know, pushing and pushing and pushing, Mao's strategy of um, uh, armed coexistence, as he called it, was to gradually raise the escalation. And eventually in that, in 62, over between the spring and October, when he, they finally really um, uh, sort of clobbered, you know, from their perspective, uh, taught the, the Indians a lesson, taught Nehru a lesson, um, although the numbers of casualties on both sides were, were not so disproportionate. Um, nonetheless, uh, the Chinese came out looking like they were the stronger power and they had they'd proven their power um, at the time. And China was not to be uh, underestimated. And that was certainly a lesson for India. And ever since then, India has built up its great, you know, get greater capabilities, including on the frontier. But I think as, as Aparna and you have said, uh, Ambassador, um, it's lagged behind what they need to do. And I think that's really one of the lessons here. U.S. policy needs to be building on the bipartisan support that we've seen growing over the last couple of decades in particular. Remember our, our strategic partnership, the new framework for U.S.-India defense relations was struck only 15 years ago. It's amazing what we've been able to do in that 15 years. If you want to look at the, the glass half full, if you're looking at the glass half empty, then you're asking all the doubts about why hasn't there been more specific, concrete sort of uh, achievements with the U.S. defense technology and trade initiative that was struck under the Obama administration and has been redoubled uh, under the Trump administration. But there is progress going on in that defense relationship. Um, and it's not just on maritime domain awareness and anti-submarine warfare. Uh, it's also on, on technology. And um, very important for us to keep improving that to help make sure that India is able to maintain deterrence. You know, uh, and John was absolutely right about the uh, the limits of, uh, of of what India was willing to do. The weak link of the quad of the the quadrilateral uh, arrangement and and the strategic dialogue plus of Japan, Australia, India, and the United States. But in the Indian Ocean, in South Asia. That's where India has the proximity. That's where India has the maximum strategic interests. And so we're simply pushing on an open door to try to help them economically, technologically, militarily. The Quad, final thought here, uh, Ambassador Khani, is that the Quad, for all of its uh, absence of uh, architecture and um, institutionalization, is a potent latent capability. It's one that really does frighten uh, leaders in Beijing, because the idea that these four large, capable democracies 
uh, could combine their forces against China's interests, well, they, they do worry about that. And they, they want to kind of nip that in the bud. But so the short answer to your question is we should be concerned, but there are a lot of things that we can continue to do to deter China and to push back and to expand our own uh, interests and values. And yes, uh, you know, look for a vision that can, can bring China into this inclusive uh, free and open Indo-Pacific in the long term. Thank you. Good. So uh, is the consensus here that uh, these incidents uh, along the Himalayan border uh, do reflect a more aggressive, more assertive China, uh, that the democracies need to uh, not only uh, shed any doubt they have about China's aggressive behavior, uh, and also that they need to come together to have a strategy that uh, bolsters those who will physically be facing uh, the, 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 the Chinese aggression, like the Indians and other countries uh, in the in, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, final thoughts, anyone? John? Well, I, I would certainly say that uh, what's occurred on the border, and it's it's been interesting in Australia, we never really used to pay a lot of attention to the border dispute between uh, India and China. And it's not just that there have been casualties. This is the first time strategically and politically our political class um, have watched what has occurred between India and China and linked that to the common maritime and economic interest that we have with India and the other Quad countries. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the four Quad countries are the four countries that recognise the need to balance, uh, recognise the need to counter and in some respects recognise the need to contain uh, China. They are also the four countries that are having a genuine conversation about economics and supply chains and so on, uh, in, in terms of how to reorientate those uh, outside China. Um, so so I, I, think, I think what this uh, border clash has done, um, it, you know, there are, Xi has done many things to anger many countries at many different times, but I think this border clash, uh, as far as the Quad countries are concerned, um, has given the Quad quite a big push forward. And the very fact that China didn't use regular means of warfare, uh, you know, people were, uh, the Indian uh, soldiers who died were clubbed uh, uh, sort of with, the, with, the, uh, uh, with, with special clubs that, uh, that, that actually had uh, the barbed wire put on to them uh, to make them more effective, actually kind of reflects uh, China's overall approach. You know, they could say we didn't shoot but they still managed to kill. Uh, Aparna, uh, what are your final thoughts? Uh, oh, three quick points. Um, I'll echo part of what John said and Patrick said. One, um, the Quad is, uh, is something that China uh, is, is worried and concerned about, especially because now uh, we are talking about Quad Plus, which includes ASEAN. Um, and even many of the European countries like France and sort of, you know, and Germany are playing a bigger role. So you may have more democracies uh, which have military and maritime presence in the region. Second, uh, India has been speaking about including Mal uh, Australia and the Malabar military exercises uh, in addition to Japan. So it would be a kind of a quad military exercise, even if not under quad. And that would send a message to Beijing. Finally, um, India sort of, sort of, you know, as part of the Indian Ocean, Indo-Pacific and Quad strategies, maybe India could also finally boost its Andaman Nicobar command um, because that lies straight on the Malacca Straits and that will have an impact on how China sort of views Indo-Pacific. So I think there's a lot India can do. Final thought, uh, India does not like alliances, but in 1971, India did sign a treaty. Uh, with the with Soviet Union, uh, even if temporary, the aim was to send a message uh, to China um, and maybe to United States. Yeah. So we After have. The war, yeah. One issue we did not address was what Aparna talked uh, about uh, India's concerns that it is alone when it comes to defending its land borders. 
Uh, and even if it became part of formal alliances or the court became a formal arrangement, that would not serve it against its uh, land-based adversaries. And there, the China-Pakistan tie-up matters a lot more to Indians than it has so far mattered to most of India's partners. Uh, I think that those issues may have to be dealt with to make sure that the court is more effective, not only as a maritime uh, uh, arrangement for the Indo-Pacific, but also uh, for the Indo-Pacific littoral, which includes the Himalayan border and the Pakistan border. Patrick, what are your final thoughts? Well, I think the Himalayans provide a pretty good natural frontier even in the 21st century. So uh, that land border is not quite as permeable as it may seem, even if the Chinese keep making encroachments. Secondly, um, while the United States and Japan and Australia may not want to get involved in India's uh, sort of land uh, border struggles, that doesn't mean they don't fully support democratic India's aspirations, uh, technology, economy, politics, um, exchanges, all of those things indirectly at least, and some of them maybe more directly do help. We don't have to go back to the covert uh, war of uh, establishment 22, go back and look it up, read your history. Um, very good covert uh, cooperation between India and the United States into Tibet. Um, but uh, if the Chinese are watching, I hope they do think about that lesson because maybe there is that potential for covert cooperation uh, between the United States and India, uh, Japan and Australia um, against malign threats, against things that specifically are aggressive, not against China, um, not against the Chinese people for certain, um, but against the aggression or aggressive acts taken by the CCP. If they want to get aggressive, we have, we have capabilities and um, I think we have to take the long view. I think uh, you know John Lee rightly pointed out the G711 uh, that hopefully will come up here this fall. Um, even with our election underway, um, if the Quad could meet on the side of that uh, arrangement, uh, if democracies could speak up on behalf of uh, India, um, I think that would be very useful. And I would encourage as well any Indian and other leaders to meet with Joe Biden uh, uh, at the same time during that visit because there is bipartisan support for the Quad, for, for US, India, for Australia, Japan, uh, to, to kind of take a leading role in helping work with ASEAN and Europe and others around the world to make sure we, we remain in a peaceful uh, rules-based system. So we have to take the long view regardless of all the upheaval we, we see this year. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic, Ambassador Akani, that um, this is gonna be a, a great growing relationship for the US, India, Australia, and Japan. I think most people on this panel would share that view. In, not, in fact, all of us would share that view. I think it's very obvious uh, that the Indo-Pacific and its security uh, remains an important concern for all the countries that we mentioned, not only in the Quad, but others as well. And that China's aggressive and assertive behavior uh, continues to uh, be an important concern. Above all, we need to be aware of it. So thank you all for joining me today. Uh, Patrick Cronin, John Lee, Aparna Pandey, uh, and that brings our discussion to an end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.